Hola. I get lost in the stars when I'm with you every day. I get lost in the atmosphere, the atmosphere of love. I'm Sean Fletcher and I'm a broadcaster on Good Morning Britain and a load of other programmes. Now, Black History Month is absolutely crucial in telling the stories of black people and events uh, that are often disparaged and ignored and sidelined. Now, when I was growing up, I never heard those stories of black people and success. And if you can't see it, you can't be it. Well, it certainly makes it a lot harder. I'm Will Drovu, a TV and radio presenter. You may know me from hosting on Good Morning Britain, The Masked Singer Unmasked and Capital Extra. Now, Black History Month is extremely important to me because it's a month where we can all learn about black history, what we've been through and unfortunately many of us weren't taught black history in school uh, so this gives us a chance to just educate ourselves you know and I think that's extremely important. Well, yeah, sure. Great to, to see, see you. you. I love you this. Know. I love this 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 jacket slash shirt you've got going on. I, I didn't get the smart memo. You, <laughs> look at you, you dressed up. Well, you know how I do. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, I haven't seen you since Good Morning Britain last month in the summer. Is it last month? It's, I think so, yeah. So yeah. I feel like I saw you loads for absolutely ages throughout the summer. Yeah. And then, and then we like sort of London buses, like I see you loads and then I don't see you at all. Literally. But, but yeah, we, yeah, we're working together. Yeah. How do you find it? It you was such it? good fun. I really, you know, I just love live TV yeah. and I love entertainment. So it was good vibes and just, yeah, everyone's, everyone's good vibes on that show. What about the earlies? Do you, do you oh get it? my days. <laughs> Seriously, it's 2.40 a.m. alarm clock. 2.40, why do you get up there so early? That's, that's. Well, I was getting in, what time? Oh, gosh, I think I was getting in at like 3.40. 40. Because you know, just to be safe, because I wanted to prepare everything. I was going upstairs as well, like to look through the scripts and stuff like that. So I was being proper like thorough. So I got in a bit earlier and then, yeah. But I, I would never eat before we went live. I oh, don't eat uh, after. So, so, no, I don't know. Like I would see uh, Kate Garraway eating. I'm like, how are you not eating food before you go on air? I do, look, I do it all the other way. So I get up, I get, I get in about five. I probably shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> if the bosses see that, they'll be cross. I get up at four, yeah. get in at five, literally roll out of bed, get in at five. Because you live miles away, don't you? I, I mean, I live around the corner. I eat loads. I just eat, eat what? and eat. You've got to, you've got to eat because if you don't eat, you fall asleep. I just drink water. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah. crazy. Look, uh, it's, it's, it's a great program to work on. It's, it's a lot of fun, but you've got to eat. You've got to eat. <laughs> gotta eat. Like, I, got I eat some, after. I got some questions. I hope, cool. I, I hope there are some Good Morning Britain questions for you in this. <laughs> I, I, I feel like way. Paxman. Let's go for it. So the first one. Did you always feel as though you were made for a presenting role? You are made. I know you're made, but did you, when did you know it? <laughs> uh, do you know what? Like, when I was younger, I always knew I wanted to be on TV, but I wasn't really sure, like, what I wanted to do. Then when I went to university, I studied media and communications, and I started doing, like, the local radio in Leicester. I'm like, oh, actually, I quite like this, quite like this radio presenting stuff. Then... I was like, oh, actually, I wouldn't mind getting into like TV presenting. And then like, obviously I was doing media and communications with journalism. And then I was kind of just like getting into that side of things. And I started doing work experience. But the thing is obviously like what I do is very much entertainment and like showbiz kind of stuff. So my passion for that sparked when I did like work experience. I think it was like Heat magazine. And I was like, yeah, I quite like the celebrity side of things as well. So I wanted to bring the two together. Um, first of all, there aren't many black guys on TV. I'll just say it up there, right? Not many anyways. Yeah. No. And a lot of the people who are on TV, they're like, some of them are like, especially the younger presenters, they are like the children of famous people or whatever. And I was like, how the hell am I going to maneuver my way into that? So I wasn't really sure, but yeah, I just kind of kept on chasing it. And was, was, was there a moment where you thought, this is what I want to do, this is it? Yeah, I would say when I left university, I was like, yeah, I definitely want to get into it. Wasn't sure if I would or if I would actually make it into it. But yeah, I definitely, I think, I'd say after university, I said, yeah, I definitely, definitely want to do it. And you know, you know how you said that like, a lot of people on telly, they're the, the sons or daughters of someone famous. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that is true, definitely in your world, in entertainment. But I, what I find where I work, everybody's worked on Blue Peter. Seriously, because <laughs> I'm a bit older than you. And yeah. I'm presenting, I present on other programmes like Country File, but Good Morning Britain, not so much Good Morning Britain, but you know, some, a lot of the programmes. I look at them and I think, I'm, I'm sure I used to watch you on Blue Peter. And they've yeah. basically had training through that. And, I think when you're doing this, you've, you've got to go for 100%. You can't go into presenting and think, oh, you know, it's, uh, I'll just see what it, how it works out. So you, there, there sort of has to be a moment where you decide, this is it, this yeah. is what I'm going to do. What you've actually said is key. Everything's changed. So yeah. like back when, like, I'm sure you were starting out, 
all the young entertainment presenters were on children's TV, Blue Peter, Tada. You make it, then you're you make all, it then sound you like I'm old. Get to the, no, you're not, back, you're not back in the twenties when <laughs> yeah, you started. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's true. Like, that was there was actually a structured route. Whereas now it's just like, boy, yeah, you know, you yeah. find yourself there, you find yourself there. I mean, it took me ages to realise that I wanted to be a presenter. I, I, I wanted to be a music producer. I still actually want to be a music producer. I, I did a degree in London, a geography degree. And then wow. I went to train to be a music producer for two years in Newcastle. Wow. And my, um, my girlfriend, now my wife, um, we had our daughter. So we were students with a baby. I'm thinking, oh, blimey. I, the aim was to just go and make cups of tea in a music studio yeah. and hope that I'd be lucky enough to produce the sort of the next or the Stormzy of the time or whatever. Uh, I, you know, suddenly I'm like having to pay for a family and it, it, it was... So wow. I, I got work at the BBC, you know, was, and that, that's it. I just sort of muddled my way into, the, into it. So, it still isn't the, the plan to be a presenter. It's just, I sort of happen to be here. But wow. there is a moment where you're on telly and you think, I, I can do this. Do you, do you ever still get nervous? Because yeah, obviously, like, when you're on Good Morning Britain, like, you're literally on TV for hours. So I'm like, you can't yeah, you, be, you can't you, be nervous by hour two, right? You come in, yeah. you, you do a bit. Because I, I do that often, that first bit at the, minute, at the beginning. So yeah, I do yeah, half an hour, news, yeah. you're, you're into that. Then you go home. <laughs> And you watch me I'm like, hours guy. later, I'm still on air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed the trick there, haven't I? Cool. Now I've got a question for you. Did you find that your black heritage impacted you in your early life? I'm thinking about the answer because I don't want to give you my whole life story because we haven't got time for that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite long and complicated. So my mother um, was, she's no longer with us, from Zimbabwe. Uh, my dad is white, so I'm mixed race. I actually spent quite a lot of time as a kid in Zimbabwe. We went back quite a bit after independence, so in the 80s. So I was born in 1974. So I've been brought up in the 70s and 80s. My experience is quite different to a lot of black people I know that age. I know you're a whippersnapper, you're much, you're much younger than me, but people my age often lived in, in cities, in black communities. And for a lot long periods of my life, my mum was the only black person I knew. We lived in a rural area, um, very white area. The stuff that she gave me, was absolutely crucial because that's all I'm getting. Um, I, I'm, dis I'm sort of disappointed on looking back that she didn't speak the, the language of Zimbabwe to me and the teacher to me, Shona, because since then my wife is Welsh. I've gone on to learn Welsh and I, there's something about yeah. that. I think, oh, that's a real shame she didn't give that to me. In the 80s, growing up in, say, places like Tottenham and Brixton, the racism that they would have experienced was was violent in your face. I mean, you just look at the history books and the news at the time. Mine was different. Uh, but I, was, I felt very much like I was on the cold face because I was the only guy, you know, I was the only black. I, lot, so many people have said to me when I was growing up, you're the first black person I've ever met. You're not that weird. You're not that different. Or, you know, th that sort of experience that I had was that I was on my own. You know, I'm, you're out on your own. And so the racism you experienced was confident and it was, it was normal. You know, it was just all around you. I mean, I, you know, I had friends who would, um, who would protect me, you know, friends who stick up for me. And th their defence was someone would laugh at you or take the piss out of you and, and they they would defend me by saying, it's not his fault he's black. Mm. And I'm thinking, hang on, that, hang on, that isn't quite, even as a seven year old, I'm thinking, that hang on, that doesn't wild. work. Because they're, they're my friends sticking up for me, but their, their, their perception of black is that it's not as good. Yeah. I'm 47 and I, I'm discovering, even now, I'm learning about my childhood and actually, wow, that, that wasn't right. I feel like the way racism is now is it's, it's just a bit more subtle, but I feel like it's kind of still there. So like, even what you're saying, I feel like I've seen it, but it's just a bit more like disguised in a way. I don't know, like, correct me if I'm wrong, like, do you reckon it's changed? Well, so I, I noticed a change about well, 10, 20 years ago where um, it, it was suddenly, it, it wasn't cool to be racist. And I'm not saying it was cool to be racist in the eighties, but you could be, people could be racist. People, you know, there were attitudes, definitely where I was from. And there were lots of people who thought that, and it's sort of all right, and there were jokes, and it's sort of okay. And it became, they, there was a tipping point where it's like, no, but that's not right. That doesn't mean people and institutions and life isn't racist, but it's suddenly it's not, you can't put a, a racist banner in your doorway or you can't say stuff that's racist because it's just not accepted and the general acceptance is not, you don't do that. Mm. But people are still like that. And I, I think that's where it's changed. It was, it was the confidence of the racism when I was young. Mm. I, I mean, I do, you're, you're so much younger than me. When, when were you born? Is that, am I allowed to ask that? that <laughs> 1904, I'm screaming. 1904. <laughs> I'm 27. You're yeah, a baby. Yeah. So I remember the 80s, and I remember being chased down the street. And um, Chased I down the street? Yeah, so I, I remember, I mean, actually sort of, this must have been, I remember the worst time was in the early 90s, and um, a lot of my friends were white. Pretty much all my friends were white, because yeah. I was in the white area, and we were out on New Year's Eve. I can just early 90s sometimes, so I was still at school, so it's been about 91, 92, way before you were born. And um, 
you were in South End, and um, so I was with a group of white kids walking back to someone's house, and uh, someone came up to us and said, um, "We weren't, you know, using the N word. We weren't that guy." And um, my friends were white, you know, they were sort of defending me, and then. He brought his, this other guy brought his friends and they pretended they had knives, they were doing all this sort of stuff and chasing after us. And, um, you know, my, my white friends, most of them got beaten up and they were protecting me. So, it, you know, I, I look back on those, those times and I sort of think, I mean, you know, obviously that, that stuff happens now, but I think it was just more yeah, prevalent. People wow. thought it was all right to go up to someone and racially abuse them. I mean, that was the early 90s, but it was a lot worse in the 80s. But I just, I, I just feel like it was, there was confidence to the races and people felt that they could say stuff. People felt that they could approach you. People felt that they could attack you. Of course, that stuff happens now. Yeah. But I think but most most normal people maybe? most normal people think that's not right. Yeah. I think people before just thought, mm. and that's not to, we shouldn't be complacent now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What's your experience? I mean, do you, do you get chased of, down the street? Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not gonna. Lie. I've never been chased down the street before. But the type of racism. Okay, so when I was in school, right. I used to be like a goth, like an emo kid. So some of the people that I used to hang around with, in fact, most of them are white. So we used to go to skate parks and everything. And I got so immersed into like heavy metal culture. So like we'd go to skate parks, we'd go to like uh, the rock and roll. It was when we went to like the, the heavy metal uh, concerts and like the rock and roll raves. That's when I was like, whoa, okay. I am really the only black person here because people are looking at you and they're staring at you. And I remember in the beginning, I was thinking, oh, maybe they're just, maybe there's something on my face. I was so confused. But there was one time when, when like, actually I was at a house party, this, it was like a rock house party and I walked into a room to just to charge my phone. And everyone was just like, went silent and looked at me. I said, I was so, I, it didn't click for a while. Like they're looking at me because I'm different. But yeah, it was kind of, it's just a bit like, like silence almost. And I just didn't understand why they felt like they could treat me that way because I looked different to them. So it was all of that kind of stuff. Then people would throw the N-word at me here and there at rock and roll race. But I thought it was like, oh, maybe it's just like, you know, this is the culture and whatever. Because it's like, yeah, rock and roll, yeah. But actually, it's not right. Do you know what I mean? So I kind of had to uh, deal with that and ask myself, um, where the hell do I fit into society? Do you know what I mean? So I kind of had to, yeah. Accept that and thinking about that actually now is quite upsetting that I had to go through that really. All right, that's um that's the next one for you. Yeah. How did you first get into radio and how was it at the start of your journey versus now? When I left uni, I joined a hospital radio station. So like going into like the wards and like getting people's requests and then you'd come back down and play at the, the radio station only would only broadcast to the patients in the hospital. So that was really good fun. Then I went over to a local FM station in Watford where I was getting more experience, like live on air and stuff like that. Now I'm on Capital Extra. So that was, yeah, it was a really good journey. Like I've always loved music. I've always loved making people laugh, entertainment and all that jazz. So yeah, it's really good fun. I'm enjoying it. Obviously I also do like loads of interviews on the radio as well. So yeah, I've always wanted to get into that side of things as well. Like even though, yes, I started in like news journalism, I've always wanted to be a bit of a, yeah, like an entertainer and just like make people feel good basically in the mornings and stuff. Yeah, I, I know I see that when you're in Good Morning Britain, you, you just smile and it's infectious and you just, so sort of give it, you've got energy. I suppose it's that, you know, you, you smile and you've got energy. And I think if you've got those two things, yeah. you're halfway there. But the ra radio is good training, isn't it? Just to sort of, to learn, cause yeah. you've got to be yourself on radio because there's so much time to fill. Whereas in television, it's a bit more scripted and sort exactly, of yeah. compartmentalized. And like for you, did you ever look into, did you do radio? You worked behind the scenes, didn't yeah, you, yeah. in radio? Well, you've done your homework. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, yeah, behind the scenes. I didn't really present on radio. I haven't done much radio presenting. Yeah. Too exposing. Too exposing? No, it's not. No, it's, it's just, you know, it, it is though, isn't it? It is. You, no, you're right. You, it is. No, it is. Yeah, if, it you, is, is. if you can't talk and you can't hold a room, <laughs> you're, you're stuffed on radio, aren't you? Whereas <laughs> the television, yeah, there's, normally, yeah. there's normally a script you yeah, can turn to yeah, somewhere yeah, or an yeah, autocue yeah. or something. You can be able to talk. Cool, let me, I've got another question for you. What would you say is your biggest achievement so far in your career? Oh, I know career, you've got loads. Career, career. Now, I, I, they, they are hard questions, aren't they? Because you just start, you know, I don't want to... But there wanna, must be like a standout stand moment. I mean, I, I, when you said career, I thought you were going to say my life. And in my life, um, I'll be really quick on this, um, it, it's having a family. When we had our daughter, we were students, everybody wrote us off. And, you know, we're still here and we've got, my daughter's 23 and I, you know, that's the proudest thing in my life. I think in terms of career, um, my son's had some, um, some mental health issues mm -hmm. and I've become a mental health campaigner and I did a panorama program on the mental health system calling out for you know, being underfunded and overstretched. 
and that when that panorama went out, that was probably the proudest moment of my life. Um, I, it didn't, you know, annoyingly, it, did, it hasn't achieved what I wanted it to achieve, but that's sort of my aim from that. But that just because it meant so much to me personally, that was the proudest moment. Yeah. Everything else sort of just pales into significance compared to that. But yeah, yeah. so I, I've I've. I've made it quite emotional and moving at the end there, but it, it, you but know, it's good. I think, do you know what? I like it when like presenters put out work that's like quite personal to them as well. But I also find that type of presenting interesting because it's like, you're not just doing the job, you're now delving into your personal life. So you're going to have to do something on goths. <laughs> I don't think I'd do it. I don't think Will I'd do the goth. <laughs> what did you look like? What, do, you have, do you have long hair? Do you know what was so funny, yeah? Because obviously, you know, all like the grunge kids, they all obviously like, all of the guys I used to hang around were, were white, had long hair, black. I'm like, what am I going to do? I used to try and dye my hair. Obviously, because your hair's black, you can't, you can't change another colour. But yeah, I, didn't, I just used to wear like, my, like the buckles and the spikes on the neck and stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah, look, yeah. you know, I've left that style behind, but I still listen to rock every now and then, you know, listen back. Throwbacks. So the, so the goth thing, what well, was that about 10 years ago? In, in 10 years' time, I yeah. want another style. <laughs> and look, look if, we're talk, if we're talking in 10 years' time, I hopefully we're going to be, we're not going to be talking about racism. We're not going to be talking about prejudice. Nope. We're going to be talking about open doors, um, just equality right across the board. For more people, for more young, young black presenters, everything. Yeah. yeah, so hopefully, you know, I'm so much older than you. I, I've sort of made the path for you, and you're going to make the path for other people. Exactly. That's it, let's do it. That's what we're going to do. Well, as a team. Let's do it. Come on, let's do Great it. Great to talk to you. <laughs>